Welcome to the Chelsea Physic Garden Podcast, the podcast about people, plants and place. Hi Jess. Hi Ned. So Jess, I've got the brief through from the Chelsea Physic Garden. They've uh-huh. given us an absolutely classic plant. In fact, it's a classic fruit. So I'm going to make you guess what we're going to be talking about this episode. (laughs) It's a biggie. Right. I'd say say one of the big free fruits. And I want you to try and guess, uh, just guess the free fruits that I'm thinking of. Okay, I'll play your little game. Uh, Banana, apple and orange. You're bang on. And what do you think is the most interesting of those three? Do you know what? I would would say orange because like it's a colour, it's a vibe. It's a name. Yeah, pretty useful you said that because we are actually doing orange. Um, although I will make you just change that intro when we get round to bananas and apples. <laughs> or they'll get mad. Okay, what are we up to? Well, as ever, I'm going to look at how and why a specific orange got onto our plates and in this case, into our hearts. Do you want me to look at literally everything else? Yeah, you do You do the everything I'll, I'll do else everything bit, else. And I'll do the one thing which I'm confident with. <laughs> Deal. Sounds about right. And then I think I'll talk to a, a, a very special guest. Oh, yeah. A home chef about the secrets of marmalade. Okay. Well, then in that case, I'll talk to Beaver Farms about how they make a drink for the mass market, which captures the essence of what makes orange so popular because it is an incredible drink. I'm obsessed with it. Perfect. Well, I'll see you back in the studio. Yeah. Then. Let's crack on. Jess, you're my culture vulture. Mm-hmm. You're my etymology wizard. I was going to try and rhyme that, but it didn't quite work. Um, does anything rhyme with etymology? Orange, probably. Um, <laughs> it's a very clever joke, by the way, guys. Yeah, look into it. Very. Look into it and you laugh. Very Drill clever down. joke. If you think about it. All jokes yeah. are better the more you look into them. Sure. Um, you don't want that instant gratification of someone bursting out laughing. You definitely want to think about something for yeah. 20 to 30 minutes. Where does the word come from? We've got this word orange that doesn't rhyme with anything else. Where does it actually come from? It comes from all the words. <laughs> the older Dravidian, but then became Sanskrit. Oh, classic. Naranga. Um, and then spoken in... in... Sanskrit's the original Indo-European language. Yes. It? And, and Dravidian's this ancient South Indian language. So ancient. But the word migrated then into Persian and Arabic and then was adopted into European languages. And we're getting a bit more familiar now with the Spanish Naranja. And then in Italian, now we're getting really familiar, Narancia, which we're getting a bit, you know, Arancine, yeah. Arancia. We're getting a bit closer. The N gets dropped. Arancia, orange. Yeah. And then in English, there's not really much of a difference between an orange or narange. Um, an orange. Oh, so we drop the n when we end up with my friend and yours, the orange. The orange. And also there's something very pleasing about like the O, the roundness of the O mm. for, for the orange. Wait, sorry. A, a little bit confused. So the word orange comes from the Sanskrit word narange, which means the colour orange. Well, no. So the word naranj that we get the word orange from, it comes from the Sanskrit word for the fruit orange. Yes. Before oranges, Mm -hmm. there was no word in English for the colour. Nope. Orange. There was no word for the colour until the fruit. Wait, so... So uh, around (laughs) the end of the 14th century, the word that allowed us to start describing things as orange... Appeared. Was appeared, which was this fruit. So our language mm-hmm. is defined by the existence of a fruit that we were like, oh, this colour that we've called, and what do they call it? Yellow red. Uh, spelled from Middle English is uh, yellow red. I'm not wowed 
by the early English speakers if that's how lazy they were with their colours. There are no other colours. Like, that's quite a common, no. you know, an orange sunset. Exactly, that's what the came or, to my mind. Orange sun, it, it occurs in nature, I, like, quite a lot. Like, there are orange flowers. That the, was yellow, red. And even Shakespeare was quite, like... He was kind of tentative in his use of it. He was like, he would preface it with like, you tawny orange. We have a line in A Midsummer Night's Dream uh, where, where Bottom's catalogue of stage beards, I mean, mm. everyone, every actor worth their salt should have a catalogue of stage beards, oh, yeah. includes your orange tawny beard. It's used in reference to to like a, the beak of a blackbird. Mm. Um, so orange tawny is in 16th century England is is used but it's it's more like that brownish shade tawny but but the color starts to lighten away from brownish fox color from red toward yellow just to back this up my friend mm. this is from on color by david scott caston with stephen farthing and this is just a lovely little extract that I think describes how orange is so unique and different from, mm. from all its other uh, friends in the basic colour register. Yeah. So this is the extract. All other basic colour terms in English are like red in that they similarly subdivide into descriptive colours mostly derived from things that are that particular shade. Green, for example, works this way. Chartreuse takes its name from a liquor first made by the Cartesian monks in the 18th century. And then there is emerald, jade, lime, avocado, pistachio, mint and olive. Hunter green takes its name, unsurprisingly, from a shade of green worn by hunters in 18th century England. Orange, however, seems to be the only basic colour for which no other word exists in English. There is only orange. And the name comes from the fruit. Tangerine doesn't really count. That's amazing. Isn't that amazing? That's so cool. So that's where the word comes from. Where does the bloody fruit come from, Ned? And I can say bloody fruit because like blood orange, Seville. It's quite a literal one. Well, the fruit comes from Southeast Asia. Like so many fruits we have, uh, it comes from uh, the Himalayan foothills, the area in kind of northern Myanmar, eastern India, southern China around when those mountains start thinning out a little bit, when they become a li little less Everestian, um, which is a term sure, I've decided. Sure, we've decided. Hi. I went with it. I went with you there. Everestian. Not literally. No. I was, I was on your gap year, mate. <laughs> no, I didn't do anything that impressive on my gap year. Um, yeah, so that's where it comes from. But as ever, if I was to look at every single citrus, which is an orange hue, we would be here all week. So I have done a deep dive into one. As is your want and as is your way, Ned. And as is my right. <laughs> and I have gone for probably the most British orange of all. Oh, here we go. Can you guess which one? Uh, no. <laughs> the the very British Seville orange. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, it's very British because we make one of our favourite products that has been forced down our throat almost literally over the last couple of months. Um, marmalade. Mm -hmm. So you could have chosen... Can I Can I t tell you what you got? What, are the, what other ones briefly what you could I, have chosen? What have you listeners missed out I've on? They've missed out on bergamot orange, which is uh, grown mainly yeah. in Italy for its peel, and that produces uh, an essence for perfumes and is used to flavour my favourite beverage, Earl Grey tea. And that is a hybrid of bitter orange and lemon. Mm. We've also missed out on mandarin orange or citrus reticulata, which mm. is a, which is an original species of citrus and a progenitor of the common orange, your supermarket mm. orange. We've also missed out on the trifoliate orange, which is sometimes included in the genus and it serves as rootstock for sweet orange trees. But you have gone for the bitter orange, citrus orentium. Yes, I'm slightly worried now of it because you know of the last names, you will know more than me. But I have gone for that. No, L I just I felt like Harry Potter there casting spells. Yeah. Citrus or anti <laughs> <laughs> Um Luckily for you, some of the story of those oranges will be covered in the story of a Seville orange. Lovely or for our listeners too. The bitter orange. Oh, but they're so. But they were in absolute bits that they couldn't hear more about the Bergamo orange. I know, got it. But they've turned off in their droves. But we'll we'll carry on as ever. The story goes back to medicine. People, plants, place. Sanskrit. Sanskrit. <laughs> Always goes back to food and medicine in this in this show. 
and the interplay, a, a kind of interplay that we've lost. So oranges start in Southeast Asia. How did they get to Seville? And the answer kind of lies, as so many of these things do, with empire. Not with a European empire, this time with the Arabian Empire of the uh, of the late first millennium. So the first Arab expansion, the first Arab conquests out of the Arabian Peninsula was this kind of extraordinary expl cultural explosion, this extraordinary feat of warfare where from Spain to Western India, all of that land was brought under Umayyad control. All of that land was part of one geographically linked and homogenous empire. Now, it didn't last in this state for particularly long, but what happens, one of these effects of when an empire conquers this, essentially until the modern era, until the you know neoliberal post-Cold War era, what an empire tended to do was create an economic space of free trade or near free trade. So these areas which had never been linked before, Spain and, you know, Pakistan, or Portugal as far as they got, and Pakistan, were linked. And in doing so, all of the things that were traded separately in these areas found their way across if they could grow. So right. When the during the Arab uh, dominion of Spain, almonds and actually Sicily as well. Uh, so Sicilian cuisine has loads of influences from from this period. Almonds, saffron, cumin, and of course oranges. Oh, I'm so glad to hear you say almonds because I did a play set in Sicily in 2013 at the National Theatre called Leila, and we had to crack almonds out of. That in the opening, it was women cracking almonds with stones to to get the almond nut out, and because we'd ordered so many, we had a, there was a run on almonds, and waitress had a really? shortage thanks to our play. Oh wow! I think maybe a decimal point went in the wrong place, and I think maybe we overordered. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so do I always think of um, almonds when I think of Sicily. Oranges were used for a variety of reasons. And in Seville, the reason that they were grown in such great numbers is that the, the Moorish uh, rulers of Spain wanted to create a kind of economy of perfume. Uh, Damascus at the time was uh, famous for perfume. A few other cities within this wider Arabian sphere uh, were known for it, and they wanted Seville to, to be part of that to be part of that uh, smelly uh, economic revolution. <laughs> um, and so they planted bitter oranges in their droves. That was smart. Yeah, quite very smart and very forward thinking of them. Um, sadly, when there was the kind of genocide against the Jewish and, and uh, Islamic peoples within the Iberian Peninsula, some of that knowledge and some of that was lost, but as comes up again and again, something that survived is food, culture, perfume, medicine. The orange trees remained and and remained a legacy. And just to be clear, these were bitter oranges that these they These were wore. bitter oranges, yeah. Okay. So they were grown for their rinds. They weren't grown for flavour. Because, of course, back then they didn't have sugar to sweeten them. And what, do you know, they call the, the rind, has, it has another name. Pith? Yes, yeah. well done. Or albedo. Oh. Or bitter mesocarp. Oh, very nice. Yeah. And it's still used. I mean, that orange smell is still kind of... You can still smell that. What do you call the segments? Pigs. Carpels. I find it weird they're called pigs because they don't... I've never heard of pigs. Have you never... So I hadn't heard this until recently. Everyone looked at me like I was absolutely <laughs> bonkers. I mean, do, do you find that happens a lot, Ned? Yeah. Maybe best I'll answer that one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, usually I'm talking about oranges for 40 minutes without break. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, this, this, they were grown there and they were grown. No, sorry. Back to what pigs? What, what were you saying about pigs? Yeah, pigs segments? are little segments. Can I have a pick of orange? A, a pig or a pig? Pig. Apparently, it's a Dun Dundee phrase and it's because they look like pigs. Now, you wouldn't think that 
Dundee has a particularly important place in the history of bitter oranges. I wouldn't have put money on it if I'm honest. No, I mean... Um, it's, it's not on my bingo card for today. For no, sure. <laughs> you would think that there are easier lines to draw between the history of the Orange and Seville. So Seville was the main port. It was a head port of the Spanish Empire with New World. Most stuff that was imported, exported to Spain into the New World was was from Seville. Mm-hmm. So after um, you know the the expulsion of the Moors and the Jewish population of, of Iberia coincided with the discovery of the New World. Um, one of the reasons Seville is kind of maintained in its it, glory um, was that it was very usefully placed for um, trade with the New World. Mm-hmm. Florida is intrinsically linked to the orange, and it's because through Seville, the orange went to the New World. Wow, okay, because, mm. yeah, you think um, Florida orange juice and... Um, exactly, yes. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's got this history, it goes back to the Arabian conquest of South Asia and the Arabian trading network that was built around the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean. It goes back that far, this kind of very American thing that is kind of intrinsically linked to our idea of the sunshine state. Yes, that's the word my brain, that's the phrase my brain was grasping for, the sunshine state. It's so funny how we accept the world so much as it is, as it's presented to us without interrogating. Yeah. But hang on, why? Why do we why have... Why are there oranges in Seville and why are they also in Florida? Like these, how, like, I've just, yeah. And why do they taste good in Florida and why do they taste what, bitter, bitter in Seville? And it's because mm-hmm. in Seville, the purpose for uh, growing them was ornamental for the blossom mm-hmm. and for the smell. Whereas... In Florida and across the uh, trading routes, they needed to grow them to be edible for the vitamin C to stave off scurvy. Oh, my goodness. Uh, That's fascinating. So it's all, after a long journey, Florida's the first place. What do you want? Bury your face in an orange. It's visceral. <laughs> Paint quite a picture there now. Yeah. Yeah, so when you get off a boat, the first thing all the men wanted to do... <laughs> is bury their face in an orange. orange. Um, moving on swiftly-ish. So they're decorative. Mm. They smell great. Yeah. They look gorgeous. Yeah. Who had the bright idea of saying, you know what else we could do with this? Mm. We could have it for breakfast. Well, we're back in Dundee. Okay. In the mid 18th century. So we've gone from Florida to Dundee. We've gone from Florida to Dundee. Well, I'm very cold now. And you probably want to warm up with a lovely bit of sugar. So we've gone from Florida to Dundee. And at this point, when we've jumped ahead to the mid 18th century, mm-hmm. now at this point, the world is globalized in a trading sense. Um, yeah, everyone thinks globalization happened with, like, you know, in, in, in the 90s. And no, 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 no. no, no, no. Very, very long uh, process and in many ways the world was kind of, well, it was very interconnected. It's been very interconnected for a long time. Uh, And Dundee is obviously part, in the mid-18th century, part of the British Empire Mm -hmm. and as such is kind of linked to all the trading routes. There are a family of grocers called the the Keeler family, um, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, who were importing orange uh, Seville oranges for use, for medicinal use, for use in kind of um, uh, uh, things to cure your ailments. At this time, what was the most popular drug in Britain? Cocaine? No. Sorry, just, you know, back then you always read about like, you know, cocaine, good for any ailments. Heroin, good for <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> good for a headache. Crack, good for... <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so what was the most popular drug? Well, probably gin, to be honest. But <laughs> sugar wasn't far behind. Um, gin and sugar, what a time. Yeah, what a what life. time to be alive. Um, and sh- so sugar, finally, with sugar, you finally have the means of sweetening the deal, of sweetening things like bitter lemon. Uh, there were existing jams and preserves mm-hmm. uh, with its kind of links back to uh, quinces, and quince, the way quince sets when you cook it, kind of made it spreadable. Uh, and the Keelers um, had the bright idea of making a bitter orange preserve. Now, what they did differently is they included some of the rind in, which is what makes a marmalade a marmalade rather than orange spread. It's the rind. So it's this combo, this trading combo of the Atlantic, uh, the triangular 
trade, which comes to Britain, which fuels the sugar trade, which in turn means that these Seville oranges generally used for medicinal or perfumery purposes could then be used and then gain popularity as uh, a spread. And this spread round, still for about 40 years, it was mainly used even by the Keeler family to make medicinal stuff. But it gradually, its marmalade became more and more popular than the other uses of the Seville oranges. How did we happen upon the, the the word marmalade? Like, how did we get from it, as, as opposed to like bitter orange spread? It just uh, originally just meant quince jam, oh, which okay. was very goes back to ancient Greek quince because quince is set do, in a I certain way. I do like a bit of quince come. with my cheese. Mm. Not gonna lie, do you like a bit of quince? I love. A bit of quince. I think there's a bit of quince energy yeah. about you, Ned, for sure. <laughs> very much so. I feel though, um, in recent years, it's just funny how tastes have trends and mm. what is what is scarce is always desired after what is ubiquitous becomes out of fashion. Yeah. So now very, very, I think, very sweet tastes are kind of... They're, it's, it's, yeah. Well, it's it's because cause they can be created um, synthetically and, it, and synthetic doesn't have the cachet that like sugar, a precious resource would have had. So, you know, if something is, you know, saccharin is a pejorative. Yeah. And saccharin is, a, is an artificial sweetener. So now tastes are moving away from like ultra sweet things because they... They, they don't have the kind of cachet that they once had. Towards the bitter. Towards the bitter, towards the more sophisticated tastes. This is the the vogue, the mode now, mm. as opposed to, I mean, even now, when I was a kid, you would have a glass of orange juice. Mm. Parents don't really serve a full glass of orange juice to their kids anymore. It's no. like that you'll get you'll get a, a thimbleful or a small glass or even watered down Just, juice. I, I grew up with Sunny D. Mate, so did I. I'm surprised that the, at your household, well, my house, we didn't. I grew up at Sunny D. I wasn't allowed it as a child. We weren't allowed fizzy drinks in my house. I don't think it was allowed fizzy drinks, but Sunny D was that one that slipped through the net. Oh, actually, I tell you, I had Capri Sun, mate. That was mine. Oh. Yeah, oh, a Capri Sun on a hot day still hits. No, still hits. <laughs> We've got two very special interviews coming up. Yes, we do. One with Leanne from Beaver Farms, where we'll be looking at why they've gone for this sort of bitter orange flavour and how they achieve it in uh, <laughs> rainy UK. And one with a 2021 Dale Main Marmalade Festival Silver Award winner, my mother, Elizabeth Sedgwick. And I would I would say the legend Elizabeth Sedgwick, personally. <laughs> So, Mum, what are your earliest memories of marmalade? Did you eat it growing up? I did eat it growing up. I ate it here at home and also when I was at school. But my mother didn't start making it until I was probably a teenager. Do you know why she started making it? Is it just it became easier to get some oranges? or? She normally would make a lot of things during the summer when there was a glut in the garden. And I think it probably was filling a, a gap in her time. And when did you start making marmalade? I first made marmalade when my mother taught me when I was a late teenager. Very nice. Was she very strict? She taught me a rather kind of lax way of doing it in the Magi Mix. So her peel wasn't terribly well cut up. It was just sort of mush. <laughs> and was it, was it nice? It was actually, it was nice, but I think I became a bit of a snob about how the peel should be cut. But that's, you know, that's the, the origin, the, why, why it's different to other preserves and spreads is that the, when it was invented, as, you'll, as the listeners will know from listening earlier, it was, um, they kept the peel in. So, so you, you, your instincts were right. You, you knew what the Keeler family were up to. Um, did you, how did your skills develop then? Because... Um, as, as the listeners know, I've, I've made a big deal of your silver award at the Dale Main Marmalade Festival, um, which you very modestly say they could hand out to everyone, but they don't, because I've not got one. I think it might be the wooden spoon <laughs> prize. I don't know. I got very nice criticism from them, which I think was accurate. Um, and they did say that it looked nice. Um, so that probably bears out the fact that I don't use a magic mix, and I was right to go the way I do. Actually, what's your, what's your general technique? What's the basic technique for making marmalade? My basic technique is taken from a Sainsbury's recipe, which is on the string bag that contains the Seville oranges. And it is 
one where you chop up the fruit when it's raw and you take out the pulp and put it in a muslin bag and put the whole lot in and cook it before you add any sugar. Um, but there are methods where you cook the fruit first and then chop it. But you always add the sugar towards the end, otherwise it just doesn't work. And what did the criticism teach you? What have you learned from, from your... <laughs> my my, my um, uh, plucky loser yeah. award. I have learned, they said that my peel was not cooked long enough and therefore it was not soft. Mm. And so this year I tried to cook it for a very, very long time. And however long I cooked it, it still didn't become very soft. And kind people have said that they actually rather like it not to be falling apart. Yeah, I assume it's one of those things that if you grow up with it not falling apart, you prefer it that way. And if you grow up with it falling apart, you prefer it that way. I mean, it's such a kind of home comfort. Why did you, because um, you, you live not far from Dalmain, you've known about the, the, the Marmalade Festival for many years. Why did you decide to enter it in 2021? I think because it was lockdown and I'd really sort of got into making things because there wasn't an awful lot of other things to do rather like my mother I was making things in the summer and in the autumn and then a bit of a lull Christmas and then desperate January when we were all locked down and it just seemed like a really nice thing to do um, and I plucked up the courage to send my bottle in because I didn't really want to get horrible criticism and thankfully I was very pleased with the criticism I got because I thought it was fair have you ever considered selling marmalade? No, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> well, on that note of modesty, uh, thank you very much. So I'm looking at one of your botanical sodas and it's a bitter orange spritz, a blend of Sicilian blood orange and bitters. So I'm interested in how did you come up with that flavour profile? Because one could argue you could have just used a bitter orange but you decided to go with blood orange and bitters can you tell me a bit about that and the processes and how you arrived at that yeah so when the kind of ideation for this um, product we wanted to create something that was really grown up and quite sophisticated in flavour uh, and try to communicate all of those different elements of the aromas and flavours that you get from a bitter blood orange. So really going back to that raw ingredient again and, and experiencing it fresh. So you get all the volatiles that are coming from the zest and the oils that are coming from the skin of the orange, as well as those sweet, fruity, citrus flavours that are slightly acidic and slightly sour. Um, and ever so slightly bitter. And we wanted to make sure that we incorporated all of those elements into our drink. Um, and literally we couldn't just kind of blend that whole orange and put that into a bottle. So we, we explored lots of other ingredients um, that were bitter, that communicated that marmalade flavour that we wanted to introduce as well. Um, and so in this drink, um, we've got some bitter notes coming from gentian root and a bit of chinchona bark extract as well that, that are characteristically bitter, but really, really complemented that bitter blood orange flavour. So we haven't got something that's really sweet, sickly and sugary. We've got something that's really clean, zesty, citrus and grown up. And we've kind of boosted those natural kind of bitter notes that you might get with that juice from that whole fruit um, by adding those other extracts, other botanical extracts to the drink. So you talked about all the different parts of the orange, but where specifically do you get, you know, you talked about the oils in the skin and the volatiles and all that and the aromatics the flesh, all the different uh, components of it, but where does the flavour actually come from or does it come from all of it? What gets used in the process? Um, so with all of our drinks, um, we have some brilliant relationships with some great suppliers um, and we go to those trusted suppliers um, for any new ingredients that we're looking at exploring. And, we've, and we also explore lots of different options as well. So we've got a really fantastic Sicilian uh, blood orange juice. And we've tried a few to make sure that we get the best one that, that really works really well in our drink. So it's um, the juice? It's the juice you're so using? So the juice is one major element. And oh. obviously 
obviously we need to make sure that we get as much flavour from as few ingredients as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but also to add all of those other layers of complexity and, and flavour, um, we've got some really lovely extracts as well. So what um, the juice might not be able to kind of deliver in the drink, we look to add that with um, natural extract. And this is the thing, that's something you see on labels everywhere. And, and do we even know what it is? Does Johnny Layperson know what it is? I, I mean, I learned about extracts from watching a very uh, riveting episode of The Apprentice where they were just going about it all wrong and they had some wackadoo flavour combinations um, that were quite hilarious as they unfolded. Um, but that's, that's what it means. The, the extracts support or accent the, the base taste. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, so the way an extract is made is it's literally it takes the fruit, in this case the blood orange, um, and uh, use a kind of um, alcoholic extract process. So it's, it's quite natural, it's as close to nature as possible, and it literally is an extract from the fruit um, and from that kind of fruit juice that we're using in the drink. So it's not artificial, mm -hmm. um, it, is a, it is natural, it's an extract, it's not a flavour. So it has mm -hmm. literally, it is the flavours being extracted from that fruit itself. And that gives you a really lovely, clean um, aroma and flavour then that we can add to the drink. Um, but you mentioned something about rhubarb. Yeah, so this drink is, um, it's kind of inspiration is that classic Italian uh, aperitivo. Mm -hmm. um, and rhubarb pairs really, really well with uh, blood orange in particular. I did not know that. So it's got those really lovely sour notes that balance off any kind of sweet. Yes. This. Um, and we wanted to create something that was grown up and sophisticated with this whole range of drinks uh, and the rhubarb was a classic ingredient that really really went re really well in this, this particular drink. Now we've spoken a lot about bitter orange flavour and marmalade flavour and it's it's kind of in the last couple of months uh, speaking in in October 2022 mm -hmm. it has taken on an almost kind of ritual significance in Britain. Yes. Because of two things. And I'm obsessed how culture turns on these moments. Uh, I, I always get very annoyed when people talk about, um, uh, oh, our culture's under France. What if it's as if culture is this kind of monolith? I know, under glass that has to be protected at all costs when it's it's a immutable thing. Yeah. A celebrity falls down the stairs. That will change culture forever. Yeah. That will always... Something, something as random and weird as that, culture will adapt around that moment. Um, in the same way that Paddington... Yes. ...loves marmalade. Now, apparently Paddington, um, they chose marmalade as it's a very kind of soft, sweet um, product, which is very distinctive. You know, it's a great word, marmalade, all of that, and that's why it's chosen his favourite thing. Well, there's something marmalade sandwiches is is a fun thing for like a child to wrap their their mouths around. Exactly. But these grown ups losing their minds. What's going on? Because wasn't it wasn't there a statement issued from the palace saying please stop leaving marmalade, marmalade sandwiches. sandwiches? You're encouraging um, rodents exactly. and vermin. Yeah, and so think it through. This is London, guys. <laughs> <laughs> this is London. This moment on the you know there was a small video made of the Queen of Paddington for the Jubilee. Mm -hmm. And because it was so recently in people's mind. But in the last 10 years, the occasions when the Queen was shown in these more um, relatable moments... Such as 2012, that, that fabulous entrance, the Bond entrance. And exactly. All that. You know, yeah. th these things became more popular. I think people realised this is what actually people wanted to see, the side of her Ooh. personality people wanted to see. And because of this moment, marmalade sandwiches and marmalade has kind of shot back into public consciousness. In this programme, we talk about the ancient significance of food products. But contemporary resonances are important too. Exactly. And there'll be people who it filters into the back of their mind about marmalade sandwiches, filters into that they might have marmalade a bit. They'll make this kind of taste um, correlation between a moment in their lives, a significant moment mm -hmm. in their lives, um, a significant moment in our cultural life, and it will change consumer habits and it will change also the significance of what was just a spread into being something a little bit more 
of having something more almost spiritual about it. And I think it's so important not to exoticize people living in the past, people living in other countries, people for, in other cultures, whatever, and act like in this modern era, we are immune to these influences on our consumer habits, these influences on what foodstuffs are of cultural or um, social significance to us. Well, people can still lose their mind out of nowhere. Have you heard about pink sauce? No. Oh, this is really, really strange phenomenon. Um, I'm sure there's probably someone doing a podcast series devoted to this TikTok phenomenon. This woman on TikTok started, made a pink sauce. When I say pink, I mean like a bright does not occur in nature yeah. coloured sauce. And what she would do is she would pour some of this pink sauce on some fried chicken, say, and eat it. And it looked really cartoonish. It looked so strange because it was like pink paint. I will. And the, the, the look of it was so sort of, uh, you know, arresting. Mm. And people wanted this pink sauce. So she started selling it. But she was not FDA approved. So people were getting ill. It was exploding in transit. It was going off and it was kind of, I think people said it tasted, I think she used, um, I think she might have been using beetroot and um, to colour it. I'm not 100% sure, but apparently it tasted a bit like ranch dressing, you know, oh, which wow. which is quite nice. But it, um, it, the, the kind of the internet lost its mind over this pink sauce mm. because it, on the one hand, it sort of, it had this clout for your TikToks. Mm. But on the other hand, it was not safe and potentially inedible and certainly not something that could cope with being transported. But this, but people really latched onto this image of eating this, uh, this pink sauce. And again, it's like, um, you know, these, these food YouTubers mm. who eat gold flecked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eating, like actually consuming gold and the clout of that, even though chefs yeah. will tell you don't put gold in stuff. It doesn't taste any good. It makes me think of um, Salt Bay. Yeah, you know, he changed a, a, a cultural relationship with salt, even because yeah. now everyone does the pose. You know, you got to do the pose when you're doing. And salt presumably, bite. someone like Molden Sea Salt will have seen a boost because you can see their sea flakes you, exactly very clearly sprinkled down. It's very photogenic, and it's just it's just really interesting that what next? What's the next thing that we decide is as quintessentially British as marmalade? You know, is it going to be gin? Well, Nigel Farage is is doing his best. Yeah, yeah, I've got a lot to say about that, but sadly we are out of time. Oh, oh, okay. Well, well, let's get, let's get a gin and talk about it, and let's get a gin and trash talk. <laughs> let's get a gin, mix it with some orange fizz, and go for it. We have been the Chelsea Physic Garden podcast. We would like to thank Tom Gilliford of the Chelsea Physic Garden, our composer, Pierre O'Reilly, Spiritland Studios, everyone at Beaver Farms, and of course the legend.